Hello, uh, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, depends on where you are joining in from. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about changing landscape of uh, open source databases. And I will uh, look at that from uh, two different angles. One is from uh, their uh, change in the open source, uh, definition of open source, open source business, and so on and so forth. And then changes which are taking place in the database uh, uh, technology. Now, in this presentation, I will use free and open source uh, software uh, interchangeably. And I know these are not quite the same thing, right? And there are some people who are very passionate about using one terminology or another. Well, I'm just going to uh, miss and match. So forgive me uh, for that. Now let's start uh, looking at some history. Where is this open source uh, software is uh, coming from? If you look at the early days, hardware and software, they're uh, actually uh, uh, bundled uh, together. And uh, software code was shipped with that uh, early uh, software, right? So the early adopters could modify the code uh, to fix the bug and add functionality as they need. And uh, those changes were also openly shared according to the academic principles of uh, opening, uh, of sharing the knowledge, right? That wasn't quite called open source at that time, right? Or even free software. Those terms came about much later, but in essence, uh, that uh, uh, was something uh, like that. Then, if you look at the 70s, uh, there are a number of things happen which uh, created the property software industry as we know it today. First is uh, we have a computer software became copyrightable item, at least in the uh, United States, right? It wasn't uh, on the list before that because, well, software code wasn't, uh, wasn't a thing. And also IBM is uh, forced to unbundle their software and uh, hardware as a, far, as a response to the antitrust suit, right? So software was copyrightable item, item which could be sold separately. And it really became a major class of uh, intellectual property at that time and still mm, uh, remains uh, uh, today, right? And there have been a lot of innovation happening in the, uh, in the proprietary software. The uh, next uh, era, which I would uh, uh, touch on, is something I would call it as an era of uh, romantic open source software and free software in 90s, 80s, right? Uh, you can uh, see here on the page, uh, picture the Richard Stallman, who was the early uh, leader of uh, uh, free uh, uh, software uh, foundation, right? And really the champion for uh, for free software. A lot of the idea at that time is what the open source software or free software is good for you. It's kind of good for planet. It was the uh, right way of uh, doing things. It was not so much about making making money, right, or even helping the corporations to make money or stuff uh, like that. In 2000, though, the open source really gets a lot more mainstream uh, adoption, right, which you can hear uh, recognized by folks like as a uh, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft to calling Linux a cancer. Uh, right. Uh, uh, obviously, Microsoft uh, is now moved away a lot <laughs> from that position, right? And uh, one of the leading companies which, uh, you, you know, works with open source and contributes to open source uh, those days. And uh, also their uh, successful exits with uh, MySQL uh, acquire, being acquired by Sun for a billion dollars, which really sounds like a lot of uh, uh, money at that time. Before this acquisition, uh, uh, the Red Hat was really their uh, exception, kind of one company which was able to IPO and really maintain the value over uh, long term. 
This is also where the enterprises recognize the value of the, uh, of the open source and it becomes a preferred choice for many. So why and how open source is important for their uh, enterprises? Well, it offers direct lower costs in many of cases, uh, of course. And uh, it also, uh, for many engineers, the, especially the good one, it's preferred to commercial software. Because if you're a gifted engineer, you're likely to prefer open source software because you can understand it better if you need. You have a source code, uh, available, right, to figure out how it works inside and why and why whatever you're doing with that software works or doesn't. You get the better productivity, faster innovation, and also what is important, you avoid software uh, uh, vendor lock-in, which can be problematic over a long time because as software become more complicated, then changing some uh, foundational stuff as database or operating system can become uh, very, very uh, uh, expensive and creating that sort of unbalanced relationship between uh, the vendor uh, and a customer. What happened in this case, uh, though, is also the new generation of uh, open source companies was born, which really started uh, the focus on the business first. Hey, there is, uh, looks like a, you know, great idea. We can have an open source solution for X and uh, make a lot of money mm, uh, along the way. The fastest way to do that in many cases is to uh, raise some venture capital, right? And a lot of open source uh, uh, those days uh, is uh, venture funded. And what that means, of course, is what uh, you need to provide the high returns to their uh, your financial backers and do it uh, quite uh, fast. And that creates, I think, this very interesting uh, dynamic, right? Where uh, very companies would use their attractive messaging of open source to obviously uh, uh, attract more attention because that's preferred by so many companies. But at the same time, focus on a building monopoly to avoid commoditization, increasing stickiness, building anti-competitive modes, all those things we teach you at the uh, business school, right, as of uh, ways to uh, build a successful uh, business. But in many cases, it's kind of comes in the conflict with uh, the classical romantic open source uh, software uh, value. With that, something I will call not quite open source got a lot of traction, right? And indeed, the majority of the software, which is marketed or, or casually referred as open source, will fall in one of those uh, buckets. Open core software, open source eventually, and so on and so forth. Let, let's look at MySQL, for example. MySQL is uh, often spoke about as, uh, you know, world's most popular you know, open source uh, uh, database. Right, but in fact, MySQL is open core. There is MySQL Community Edition, which is open source. It is, however, missing certain features which are reserved for the, the Enterprise Edition, which is commercially uh, commercially licensed. Right, so that means you cannot get all the features. Uh, which you may need in open source solution only in uh, in a proprietary uh, one. The other uh, approaches would be open source eventually. That's uh, when you uh, have a, mm, a software which is released under property license and then after a certain number of years goes open source. You have shared source licenses, for example, uh, MongoDB uses SSPL license, which uh, 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 which uh, uh, restricts competition from from cloud vendors and mm, so on and so forth. And uh, there is also an interesting class of software which is open source compatible software. I would like to focus on that a little bit, uh, mm, a little bit more. Right. Uh, one thing I like about the open source compatible software, what well, typically uh, this software is, doesn't claim to be open source, right? It's, uh, you know, honest proprietary software, which claims to have some level compatibility with the open source software, right? 
The important thing though, is what you understand what this compatibility typically means, right? And I uh, like to call this compatibility as a Hotel California compatibility, which makes it very easy to check in, but kind of not so easy to uh, check out. The open source compatible technologies often are very much focused at making sure it's easy to migrate from open source technologies to them, but uh, then uh, uh, provide some additional features, right, which you would likely adopt and then make it very hard to move back to open source uh, software if you uh, ever need to. Keep this in mind, and if you're using open source compatible software, and if uh, really ensuring where you are not locked in is important for you, make sure you test your software with uh, their open source software in question. For example, in a database space, if you're running Amazon Aurora and want to, uh, to ensure your uh, software can still run on a play in MySQL, make sure to test that not just hope for that. Uh, now, if you think about that uh, not quite open source software, it kind of has an interesting impact to the open source movement in general. On one extent, it really allows much more investment and a higher pace of innovation in the, in the open source space than uh, uh, just a bunch of mm, Romanti folks would be able to provide, right? But at the same time, uh, this software does not uh, provide all the value of a fully open source uh, software. And uh, even worse, in some cases, it may mislead people and erode the value of the understanding of the open source uh, software as it is. Now, if you move to the closer times, 2010, so we have a, a, a raise of a cloud and cloud obviously brings a lot of unique challenges and opportunities to open source software. I think one uh, very interesting effect of a cloud is uh, what before the cloud, many companies would rely on GPL and dual license to prevent folks from uh, building commercial derivative of their work and uh, monetizing that without giving anything back, right? For example, uh, MySQL had a very successful uh, dual license business where if you GPL doesn't work for you, you want to build commercial entity, commercial derivative, you can do that, but you have to buy uh, the uh, MySQL under different license to do that. With the cloud, the, uh, you do not uh, actually do software distribution. So you can use uh, a GPL a modified version of GPL software without paying anything to anyone, right? So for example, Amazon Aurora, there is a few other cloud vendors run derivatives on MySQL and uh, make a lot of money on that commercial derivative without having to pay anything to a MySQL copyright holder, right? And that really broke um, a lot of business model and really forced a lot of the companies which uh, are really capital heavy and really need to focus on uh, providing, uh, you know, high return, uh, right, to, uh, to uh, their backers. Uh, they had to change the licenses away from the open source to the licenses which are not quite open source, but really protect the, them from uh, uh, being able to uh, disrupted by you know, cloud uh, or hyperscalers, right? They are, of course, uh, within their right to do those things. And as a businesses, they are uh, responsible, uh, right, to, to their shareholders to do that. But uh, we just have to be mindful that those uh, changes means that there is uh, less of open source software uh, uh, available. Another interesting thing, uh, what have been happening with the cloud is what I would call the great rebundling, right? If the cloud services, you now often have your hardware cost and usage costs kind of mixed together, right? For example, if you are uh, buying uh, Amazon Aurora instance, right? It's not really separated. Oh, this is how much I pay for a software and this is how much I pay for 
hardware. And that is problematic uh, for open source because you don't have a zero price effect anymore, right? There is something very much magical about price uh, free, which often takes us to, uh, you know, spend more time, right? Even or effort working with a free uh, solutions when even if they are uh, paying, you know, just a little bit of money to, to get them. Additionally, the uh, most convenient and easy way to adopt the mm, data, uh, databases uh, has been uh, uh, becoming the pattern called the database uh, as a service. And uh, it is fantastic. And I think that is where the databases are moving at large uh, at, uh, at the future, uh, right? Uh, and uh, the added benefits or interesting benefit it provides is what that really allows developers to choose more uh, database technologies to meet uh, their uh, needs like an experiment more. Because in the past, you know, before database as a service, if I want to deploy this kind of a new database and use it in my software, I would need to make sure the ops team is able to provide all kinds of services, keeping it at 24 by seven security, patching policies, uh, so on and so forth. With database as a service, often that can be outsourced to a vendor and you are, uh, as developer, you know, just get a database instance you can, mm, you can use. And I think that is one of the reasons why we see uh, really so many companies using uh, increased number of purpose-built uh, databases, open source and not for their uh, applications. Another thing which I think is quite um, uh, interesting about the uh, database as a service. Well, uh, as many, uh, many things, uh, it tends to be over-marketed, right? It does provide a lot of fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic benefits, but its promise is much higher than that. We find uh, a, a number of customers which come and say, well, you know what, we kind of, we are sold on that kind of fully managed database as a service. You don't need, um, you know, any DBAs on what's not. But then we figure out you actually need somebody to understand the databases because database as a service is not going to design a schema for you, right? Or uh, tell you how to uh, rewrite the queries from bad queries to good queries and stuff like that, which is uh, one of the, uh, you know, core functions of, uh, your uh, DBA team, if you have that. What we also have found is a database of uh, which do not have a lot of database knowledge and uh, uh, and uh, understanding, uh, right? They uh, often uh, would have some additional problems when it comes to database as a service usage. For example, there has been in the last few years uh, a lot more cases of uh, security incidents because databases have not been configured appropriately. Uh, increased level of you know uh, downtimes, for example, because of lack of appropriate capacity planning, uh, you know, and uh, so on and so forth. Right. So uh, keep that in mind if that's uh, something uh, uh, you are thinking uh, thinking about. Now, if you think about the cloud, I think right now there is those two different approaches how cloud can be used. And they are in use at the same time and different teams think about that differently. Some think about cloud as commodity and uh, you know, compare that to something like electricity or your internet provider, right? They are, they are not so very much differentiated. You can switch one to another relatively easily, right? And th this then means you leverage a lot of power in negotiation, right? If you uh, would ha uh, have one, right? In this case, uh, you are using many of the compatible implementations, you know, maybe using S3, uh, right? For storage compute instances. Uh, in many cases, those days, the, that is where Kubernetes is being used as a, uh, a you know, uh, a cloud neutral 
uh, API, right? And that really gives you a lot of flexibility picking and choosing cloud, but it's not maybe as polished or as effective. And that is where the other approach comes in when you say, hey, I am going to use proprietary solutions available from uh, the, the vendor, right, to build my applications as quickly as possible, right? I would use uh, database technologies such as Amazon Aurora or even DynamoDB and so on and so forth, right? And a full stack of those highly differentiated proprietary technologies, which will uh, possibly allow me to move faster but comes off with a risk where if I have to adopt another uh, cloud, it will be uh, very expensive and uh, uh, impossible. What we see though from our side, and again, they're quite biased in the uh, open source uh, space, what uh, nobody really wants to be uh, the host uh, and with the trends with database as a, database as I described, um, you uh, see the pivot happening towards what you can call the multiverse, where multiple database technologies are used in uh, multi-cloud and uh, hybrid cloud um, uh, environment, right? Uh, for this ecosystem, you can see actually a lot of proprietary solutions are available, right, to run multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. All cloud, uh, big cloud vendors, as well as companies like VMware uh, have some solution in this market. And uh, additionally, we have a Kubernetes emerging as this kind of leading open source alternative, which works on any cloud, uh, being that public cloud or, uh, or uh, private cloud. If you think about the open source uh, databases, how do, uh, 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 do they evolve in uh, this market and what they should do? One thing I think they should adapt for cloud native deployment in multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environment, right? This is uh, different compared to on-prem on deployments from uh, many uh, dimensions, right? Uh, the second, uh, is what the Kubernetes API is really API of choice for many open source database uh, deployment, right? And we see increasingly uh, standardization happening in uh, this place. What I think is still uh, missing right now is uh, a focus on simplicity, right? If you really want to have an integrated database as a service solution, which is similar to Amazon, RDS, Aurora, Google Cloud, Scale, and so on and so forth, from terms of sim <clears throat> simplicity, it is uh, uh, hard uh, uh, to do, right? I mean, I don't see, uh, uh, haven't seen the open source solutions which are at that level yet. Yeah. So in your case, I think uh, as you're choosing database as a service, you may not be able to get everything from open source yet, but at least ask a question in this case, how do you get from uh, most from uh, open source? From our side uh, at Percona, we are really working uh, hard to push the boundaries of what open source can uh, offer with our products. Percona monitoring management, which is your kind of GUI for, uh, GUI for uh, monitoring right in the future um, deployment and management, and also operators, which really allow you to uh, run the databases in, uh, uh, in Kubernetes environment efficiently. Okay, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I wanted to talk about the database uh, database technology uh, and the changes that are happening in, uh, uh, in this space. If you think about the brief history uh, in, uh, uh, of the database technologies, it's kind of interesting in terms of what uh, everything old is now new again. If you look at the very early days of the database technologies, you know, 60s, 70s, there was a lot of uh, different uh, models, implementations, languages, right? And a lot of uh, uh, fragmentation. There by 80s and 90s, we have a lot of uh, standardization happen and uh, 
pretty much complete dominance of relational databases and SQL query language. There have been different databases, of course, and different vendors, but uh, uh, the big uh, uh, language decision and so on and so forth was very much unified. And if you look at, uh, starting from the thousands, we have a new wave of innovation, which both applies uh, in terms of the data models, as well as uh, uh, the query languages. So what trends do we see actually right now as we are starting our 2020s? Well, one is what we see developers and architects are empowered to make more choices related to the database uh, technology. Uh, we spoke about that when it uh, comes to uh, one of the drivers for that is uh, database as a service. That means developers can actually, you know, choose technology and have that run for them without needing uh, another team of ops people to commit to that, at least in certain uh, environment, right? So cloud makes using those multiple databases easy. And now, which is interesting, is the microservice architectures, right? Or even if you don't go all the way to microservice architectures, right? Uh, kind of decomposing to the monolith to, uh, to more building blocks, that often means that each of those building blocks uh, have its own needs and its own choices for a data store, right? And that's how multiple technologies may be uh, adopted. And that also brings us the term of uh, multi-store, where in so many cases we would have the same information which is stored uh, in a different form uh, in uh, uh, multiple systems, right? For example, one may uh, use, uh, let's say, MySQL as your database of record, right, to record the, you know, orders and so on and so forth, and then shift the data through Kafka to elastic search for full text search needs because it's much better. And then uh, you use the same Kafka to ship the data to uh, ClickHouse or Redshift uh, to uh, really have a, you know, very fast uh, analytical you know, workloads, right, with a, um, with a column store. One question you may ask is, uh, okay, I will use this should be using relational or non-relational databases. One, I think it's a uh, thing interesting in this case, so it's even now, uh, right, while we have a lot of other databases come to fruition, the relational databases are still completely dominating, at least in terms of a general purpose databases. But at the same time, if you look at the growth rate, what you would see, you would see uh, things like uh, uh, time series databases, right, or document database and so on and so forth, they all grow a lot faster than, uh, uh, than relational databases in uh, uh, those days, right? So a lot of those special purpose databases are growing uh, much uh, faster. There is uh, two innovation which happens with a data, uh, data model. One, uh, and uh, one approach is to break with relational data model entirely, right? That's uh, how many companies did, you know, thinking, uh, you know, Cassandra, MongoDB, Redis, and so on and so forth, or extend SQL, right? And that is also what uh, have been happening in many SQL technologies, you know, think about uh, MySQL or Postgres or SQLite even, all of them have extended their relational SQL model to process the document data, such as JSON specifically, Mm, better. Another thing uh, which I uh, I see uh, quite uh, uh, interesting, this is another kind of dual trend uh, where two competing approaches exist. Uh, one of them is multimodal databases. That is when you have one database which can actually be used through a different protocol using different models. For example, ArangoDB supports many different models, or even MySQL, while it doesn't uh, uh, market itself as multimodal database, it has both a SQL interface and also doc store CRUD uh, 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 protocol as well, uh, right? Uh, and then another one uh, is um, hybrid uh, transactional analytical databases versus multi-store. One approach is to say, hey, you'll have one database for example, uh, the, you know, PinCup, StyDB, and many others, which 
will uh, really be very good at both running analytical queries as well as your transactional queries. Where another approach is saying, hey, you know what, we will use one database technology, which is transaction optimized, another which is optimized for analytical queries, right? And uh, the data will flow between them. Both approaches are currently used uh, successfully and in fact will be very interesting to see if there would be some call, uh, they coalesce somewhere in the future or we'll have them mm, uh, happen at the same time. In terms of scaling, uh, there are two scaling approaches which come to the databases. One is traditional and from early days is scaling up, right? If you think about a couple of decades ago, right? If you needed to scale your Oracle instance, you often would, you know, buy even bigger sandbox, right? And run it, uh, run uh, on it. The scale out, uh, approach means instead of that, we'll spread database across many, many uh, systems, right? Often it also can be referred as uh, sharding. The MongoDB, Cassandra, uh, you know, Yugabyte, uh, PlanetScale, uh, Vitesse, right? They're all designed with that uh, scale out in mind. And uh, it is no question what if you want to build a huge scale applications, you know, think uh, Facebook scale, uh, right? Uh, then you can't really scale up. There is no single server which can run uh, Facebook workload, uh, right, uh, in, in existence, right? But the question comes is, well, do we need uh, both, right? Do we need both the databases which are optimized for working very efficiently, maybe for medium-sized databases mm, in the constraints of a single server, or should we be only looking at those the, uh, distributed databases, which tends to be kind of more complicated and have some different performance uh, characteristics? A couple of architecture trends uh, to uh, which are driving, I think, in uh, in uh, the decisions for databases right now is uh, the locally distributed. Right, that is uh, pretty much your shorter database, right? Very allowed to, uh, allowed to uh, scale out. But uh, another interesting trend, which many people, uh, many use cases demand right now is geographically distributed. When you can say, well, I need my database to live in many geographical regions, which can be because of uh, their performance reasons, it can also could be because of illegal reasons. You may uh, have a, a local government saying, hey, well, the information of my users needs to be stored in my country, right? And if you mm, uh, want to have all your users in a single database, well, you'll have to have your database kind of to be geographically uh, aware. We have a lot of work going on with the cloud native and Kubernetes focused databases. Uh, and at the same time, also many databases are being built as a cloud only databases, which are available only in the constraints of that given proprietary cloud. You know, think about Cosmos DB, DynamoDB, which I uh, also, uh, mentioned already. Another interesting trend is separation of a storage and compute, which a lot of databases are thinking about, or at least pursuing because the mm, uh, you know very uh, seductive uh, benefit of this approach is what that allows you to scale storage and compute separately, and it allows you kind of to have your compute stateless, right? Which you know brings uh, many other architecture design uh, benefits. Though uh, that is not something about what traditional databases like MySQL, Postgres, or even you know Mongo has been uh, designed for. Hardware acceleration is another very interesting, uh, uh, interesting trend, right? We see uh, many analytical databases, for example, figuring out how to use GPU successfully. There is also a uh, new generation of storage coming in, which can accelerate some of the database uh, uh, the operations and uh, uh, so on uh, and so forth. Well, uh, as a summary, I wanted to uh, highlight what there is a lot of going on with uh, uh, in the open source database space. 
I think that is uh, a great time to be involved with uh, open source uh, databases. There is a lot of uh, fun things to do and uh, as well, a lot of career opportunities in, uh, which comes with open source uh, uh, databases, right? One thing on my personal level, which I would encourage you all uh, to do, uh, is to what extent it possible, uh, keep uh, the open source uh, uh, open uh, and uh, for uh, benefits of uh, all of us. And with that, that's all I have for you folks. And uh, feel free to reach out if you have any comments or questions.